Hello. Welcome to our program. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, and our program is uh, the Digital Slide Review and Sign Out program. But today we're tackling a somewhat different question in terms of uh, what we can do with various immunohistochemical stains um, in a somewhat challenging area, that of uh, diagnosing hyperplasia. As I mentioned, our program is part of the Digital Pathology Academy, a uh, joint venture with uh, uh, the Digital Pathology Association and Path Presenter. And you'll be able to view these digital slides uh, for yourself. Um, the link will be in the uh, description of the uh, video below. So uh, the question I've asked here today is, does immunohistochemistry help in identifying and classifying atypical hyperplasia or endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia? And this is uh, in light of a number of studies and uh, additional antibodies that have become available uh, recently uh, and a greater understanding of the pathways that are involved in the uh, precursors of endometrial carcinoma. So as you know, morphologically, there are a number of things that can look a lot like endometrial hyperplasia. Uh, and these can be things that are in polyps uh, so-called disordered or perimenopausal endometrium oftentimes has a, a sense of disarray and even some uh, atypia that may look a lot like uh, atypical hyperplasia. And of course, uh, non-atypical hyperplasia or so-called secretory hyperplasia also uh, can have features that uh, mimic or can be confused with atypical hyperplasia. And since the treatment differences are not trivial, uh, these differentiations are important. So this uh, issue came to light uh, when uh, this particular sample <clears throat> was uh, referred to us uh, from an outside hospital uh, who had in turn uh, consulted a, a colleague at uh, uh, a uh, well-known institution. Um, and as you can see at low magnification, these are two sort of chunky fragments of tissue, a little bit of glandular dilatation, not a whole lot of crowding of these glands, and not a lot of normal background endometrium to compare them with, uh, but a little bit, uh, you know, could, could this be a polyp? There's some vessels. Uh, could it be hyperplasia? There's certainly some irregularities to the architecture uh, as we look at this. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, referring pathologist, I think, was uh, justifiably uh, concerned. Uh, but at the same time, perhaps not overly concerned or worried about the lesion based on just the relative proportion. This is, this is be at the very earliest thresholds of uh, development of atypical hyperplasia, as you can see, because there's still a very uh, low gland to stroma ratio uh, relative to some of the more obvious cases that we see. But uh, in, in uh, their defense, uh, the uh, consultant had performed uh, an immunohistochemical stain uh, using uh, the marker uh, PTEN or P10. Uh, and uh, based on this marker, they had suggested that there was a strong possibility of atypical hyperplasia. And that feature was based on the loss uh, in a reasonable number of these glands of uh, the uh, P10 marker. As you can see, uh, in the normal stromal cells, it stains the nuclei quite nicely. Uh, there's some cytoplasmic and a little trace perhaps of nuclear staining uh, in these other glands. Uh, but uh, some of these glands are just completely uh, negative, not taking up any of the marker at all, uh, seemingly excluding it uh, completely. Well, uh, so this uh, prompted us to look a little further into this issue. Um, and a number of markers have been proposed, and there's actually a fairly good study uh, recently from UT Southwestern, which uh, evaluated several of these uh, in a reasonable sized uh, cohort of patients with hyperplasia. And these are the markers that they looked at, P10, PAX2, mismatch repair protein, uh, MLH1 uh, in particular, uh, beta-catenin, and ARID1A. Now, these, some of these are widely available, others are less frequently available, but certainly this question is common enough that uh, should they become de rigueur, uh, more laboratories would do them. 
Uh, as we come to understand the pathways that are involved in uh, development of endometrial carcinoma, we can see here that uh, P10 uh, can be lost and that uh, has a role to play relative to apoptosis. Uh, we know that the mismatch repair proteins are involved with DNA damage repair and that that plays back into several of the proliferation and apoptotic pathways. Uh, ARID1A is an inhibitor uh, both in uh, the telomer, telomer biology as well as impacting uh, DNA uh, repair. Um, and the CTNN1B has a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, activating effect in terms of proliferation and so forth. Uh, it's not clear from the diagram where PAX2 operates, uh, but uh, suffice it to say it's been uh, uh, put forward as a putative uh, marker. And uh, so here's this, the, some of the demonstration of uh, <clears throat> the findings using PAX2 in uh, atypical hyperplasia versus normal. So while occasional glands uh, may lose the uh, PAX2, most of them will be strongly positive. Uh, here you see a couple of others compared to areas of uh, atypical hyperplasia, which may have some residual normal glands that retain uh, PAX2 activity. Uh, but show evidence of loss of this marker. Similarly, with uh, P10, uh, you can compare the normal findings here with sort of weak, pale cytoplasmic staining, stromal positive staining, uh, and <clears throat> complete loss in the glandular uh, structures. Uh, notice, however, that occasionally there are small zones uh, in normal endometria where P10 can be lost. Um, and this may be pertinent to our current case, uh, as we will uh, see uh, further. <clears throat> and now, uh, so those are the two most frequently used markers. Um, beta catenin would be another one, um, maybe a little bit more tricky to interpret, uh, but uh, generally speaking, strong cytoplasmic and especially cytoplasmic and nuclear staining <clears throat> are associated with um, uh, dysregulation in this gene uh, in comparison with uh, normal uh, tissues, which may show kind of weak cytoplasmic and occasional strong cytoplasmic, but generally no strong nuclear staining, as you can see in this third panel. <clears throat> so uh, summary of the data from this study, which compared, as I mentioned, uh, a good cohort, about 90 cases of atypical hyperplasia with a smaller cohort of normal endometria at different phases, um, <clears throat> they found these results. So PAX2 almost uh, uniformly present uh, in their uh, cases, uh, beta catenin uh, abnormalities in a sizable number, some P10 cases as well, uh, squamous morials in some, ARID1A and MLH1 much less frequently, P53 virtually non-existent. And so they came up with a, uh, a p-value table showing that there was a positive association um, to some degree of significance uh, with uh, these um, uh, markers and uh, most strongly here with beta catenin and squamous morules if that's present that uh, seemed to be uh, a marker. <clears throat> Now also note that the uh, uh, number of cases and the number of aberrant markers seem to peak about uh, two. Uh, so uh, of the proportion of their cases, I think which were about 90 cases, two thirds of them had two uh, markers uh, that were positive. So uh, certainly greater number of markers increases the likelihood uh, that uh, there's going to be a uh, abnormality. So in summary, um, let me say that I think histology is still important. Uh, and in fact, these immunohistochemical and molecular findings need to be interpreted very closely in the context of the morphology. <clears throat> I will say that the uh, UT Southwestern study uh, might have been more useful had it compared atypical hyperplasia, EIN, with some of those other mimics, uh, normal hyperplasia, secretory hyperplasia, perimenopausal endometria, uh, those sorts of things, rather than with uh, clearly normal endometria, because I think uh, we don't know the diagnostic sensitivity and value 
in the true differential diagnosis uh, uh, issues that we uh, encounter uh, every day. Uh, Singer marker studies might help, but I think generally uh, uh, I would prefer that if you're going to do this, follow this route, you should follow two uh, or more markers uh, to assess it. Uh, certainly PAX2 is the most, uh, the best candidate amongst those to be included, probably PAX2 and P10. Um, but in the context of an abnormal histology and a dual marker abnormality, you have some pretty strong support for uh, the likelihood of atypical hyperplasia or endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia. Having said that, a lot more validation work needs to be done on this. So what happened with our patient? Well, she came to our institution and got a hysterectomy. We examined the entire endometrium and this was essentially the most abnormal area, a little bit of a polypoid change. And, and as you can see here, there's a, a little bit of uh, glandular crowding. Uh, it's a little dark because it's somewhat thick and th thickly sectioned. Um, so here in this area, we do come to the point where we have you know, probably greater than 50% glands. Um, the cytology, however, uh, between this area and the adjacent uh, more uh, baseline endometrium, uh, not particularly different uh, cytologically uh, with these other areas. Uh, so just to have architectural abnormality. So I don't think that this would meet most people's criteria for EIN based on the cytology not being significantly uh, different. Uh, in, addition, <clears throat> in addition, we repeated <clears throat> the P10 and also did a PAX2, which uh, as you can see here, uh, does not show an abnormality uh, in this area of greatest concern. We have pretty uniform uh, uptake in uh, both the uh, uh, putative uh, uh, hyperplastic glands and the stroma surrounding, uh, so not a significant abnormality there. Uh, and then when we go to the uh, P10 staining and look again in this area of uh, greatest concern, <clears throat> it's a little bit iffy. So we have a slightly less uh, uptake compared to some of the more normal glands around, <clears throat> but I don't think this is the uh, kind of totally negative exclusive exclusion of the stain uh, sort of pattern that we would have uh, expected. So either the uh, uh, abnormal uh, atypical hyperplastic glands with P10 exclusion were totally excluded or we missed them in sampling uh, or <clears throat> the uh, the staining that was used uh, was uh, falsely positive or negative, uh, depending on the, the situation. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I hope that helps you a little bit to figure out kind of whether you should apply this and use this or in what circumstances you should do that, uh, or maybe if this is something that's worth further study and uh, investigation. I think to sort of summarize, I would say the final answer is that a panel of immunohistochemistry consisting of perhaps PAX2, P10, and beta catenin may be useful in confirming uh, endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia in the appropriate histologic setting uh, and clinical setting. Uh, I would be reluctant to apply this broadly on every uh, curatage in uh, over 40 year old woman, for example, uh, because I don't think we know enough about the diagnostic performance in that setting. So uh, I hope uh, those comments and uh, those uh, slides will be useful to you. Um, I think we have to continue to look at how we uh, manage these threshold cases that are somewhat challenging uh, and make sure when we design the studies that we really are designing them in a way that will help diagnostically uh, to confirm uh, and provide value to uh, the pathologists who are on the front line of these cases. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.